folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. This is going to be the ultimate, the King James Code series. Not the last one, because I still have other numbers to deal with. But the ultimate in the sense that we're going to deal with the number of this Bible. There is a number, there's several of them, but there is a particular number associated with this Bible. And that's the one that we're going to study. We study numbers because God told us to count things when he said, listen to this, Revelation 13, 18, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding, now wisdom and understanding are two of the seven spirits of God mentioned in uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. So, do you want wisdom? If you have understanding, and under, wisdom and understanding being part of the seven spirits of God, those things are imparted to us in these days by the words that are in this book. If you want wisdom, read this book. If you want knowledge, read this book. If you want understanding, read this book. Those three words that I just gave you, they're all mentioned in the book of Proverbs. And all three of those words in the book of Proverbs are related to the very number that we're going to talk about today and probably next week. And that number is the number for this Bible. I'll tell you what it is in a minute. But anyway, he's telling us if you, if you want wisdom and if you have understanding, Spirit of God, count the number of the beast. Count things. I count things in the Bible. So when we study numbers, number one, we seek to find out from the scriptures alone what each one of those numbers mean. For instance, the number seven. I can take you to Genesis chapter two and show you word for word what the number seven means because it's related to the Sabbath. The word Sabbath literally means seven, all right? Or like seventh day. And so on the Sabbath day, God sanctified it. God ended his work and he blessed it. So... On this one particular day, the number seven day, Sabbath day, the number seven means something that's sanctified and pure, something that's blessed, and something that is hallowed or something that God finished. The number seven means completion, perfection. It's done. There's nothing that can be added to it, right? So, various people have tried, believe me, various people throughout history have tried to do something other than a seven-day week. People have said, I suggest that we add three days and make it ten. Ten's an easier number to deal with. Seven kind of gets complicated, right? People have tried it. It's never worked. It's never stuck. You know why? Because Solomon told us that when God does something, nothing can be added to it, and certainly nothing can be taken away from it. It is the work of God, and it remains that way. So ever since the creation, we've had seven days in the week and that seeks to show us the meaning of the number seven we stick with the bible uh the number five we just got done doing a series on the number five and how it's related to the rapture or the translation and each one of these cardinal numbers like one two three four five six seven eight nine ten the number 11 the number 12 the number 13 the number 22 the number 33 and so on Number 17, all of these numbers have meanings and those meanings are always given to us in the plain text of the Bible. In other words, no reading between the lines. Do you know what's between the lines in your King James Bible? Nothing. There's nothing there. Hence, there's no wisdom to be gained. There's no spirit or aura that comes from the little white area. The Kabbalists believe that. Jewish Kabbalah Mystics believe that in the white spaces around the black letters on their Torah scrolls, that that white, they call it white fire. The white fire has more significance than the black. The black fire is the ink on the paper that makes the letters. And the Kabbalists say that there's more to be gained as far as wisdom and knowledge from the white fire than there is the black fire. In other words, yeah, you can read the text of the Torah, but the real meaning comes from the blank areas around it and i'm just going okay you guys are smoking something funny and tell you that no what it is they have a different spirit 
They have a spirit that emphasizes God not speaking. That's what all the white area talks about. So, when you study the Bible, you will get an understanding of how God is using these numbers in the text, like 550, 500, 5,000. Those numbers are all given in the Bible. 7 or 70 or 77 or 7,000. Those numbers are given to us in the scriptures as well. <clears throat> and if you study them, God will give you understanding as to what these numbers mean. So, part of the King James Code is that we study the meaning of the numbers that are in the plain text of the Bible. The second part of that is, is that we see that God has ordained in this book recognizable patterns. Let me give you an example. If you look, same chapter, Revelation 13, if you look in verse 16, he, the false prophet, causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. There's six things here, all right? And this list of things, if you look at them, they're all opposites. Small and great are opposites. Rich and poor are opposites. Free and bond are opposites. You cannot be free and be handcuffed in prison at the same time. Physically, you can't do it. So they're opposites. So here's a list of things in the Bible. That list has a number, the number six. And when you understand the number six, then you understand why the Bible is giving you six things here. There, God is making the connection for you in your mind. And there are other lists in the Bible. Uh, one in particular, Romans chapter one. It gives you a list of things that if you do them, you're worthy of death, okay? Starting with verse 29 of Romans 1, being filled with all unrighteousness. And if you count everything that's in this list, you get down to the last one, which is unmerciful. There's 23 things here. 23 is a number for death. And if you want a witness to that, read the very next verse. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things, the 23 things, are worthy of death. 23rd Psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, right? If you look in Genesis chapter 23, you find death, all right? I'll let you look at it later. You can pause me right now. And you should have taken that time to look at Genesis 23, all right? Because it deals with death, all right? So whenever I see a list of things in the Bible, I count that number. Um, you know, the Bible where it talks about uh, neither death nor life nor principalities that can separate us from the love of God. There are two groups there of things that cannot separate us from the love of God. When you add them all together, there's 17. 17 is another number that's associated with the rapture, the translation. The number 17 refers to transformation. If you go look in Genesis 17, you'll see something changed. In Genesis 7, in fact, two things are changed in Genesis 17, all right? So anyway, when I say King James Code, that's what I mean. Not some secret mystical that every 15th letter, if you take that letter and go to the next letter to its immediate left, and then you take those and add those together, the numerical significance of each letter, and then spell the words out, you'll get gobbledygook. I have no idea what that means, all right? And that's something that... The Bible never tells you to do that, but it tells you to count the number to get wisdom and understanding. So, I see in the Bible, the Bible teaching you the numbers and what they mean and patterns in the Bible. Because God is a God of order and the Bible specifically says God is not the author of confusion. Meaning that what God authored Every aspect of it is in perfect order. Think about it. His creation, God's creation is in order. The sun rises and sets, and those who are in charge of the farmer's almanac can forecast the sunrise and sunset times for every day of the year, probably on out to 100 years maybe. I don't know. But they can do that. Why? Because God is ordinal, ordinary. God is in order, and everything that God does has an order to it. I use this illustration because I think, you know, we, in our minds, our brains are built to try to recognize 
patterns and order. If we look at someone's face and there's something about their face that isn't quite right, we immediately recognize it. You know, some people, their eyes are closer together than everybody else's, right? Some people, their eyes are farther apart, like Oprah Winfrey has like wide eyes, all right? And we recognize that because we say something's not quite ordinary. And we are used to recognizing patterns. So, let's say that you're walking down the street, Festus, Main Street, Festus, Missouri, and you look down and you see a penny on the ground, all right? Well, you reach over and pick up the penny, all right? You, oh, somebody dropped a penny. That's our first conclusion is someone dropped a penny. We don't normally think that if we see a penny on the ground, somebody deliberately placed that penny in that exact spot. That's not our first thought. So we walk 10 steps. Lo and behold, there's another penny right there in front of us. And you're going, somebody's either a kid's dropping money or somebody's pulling stuff out of their pocket and dropping pennies and just don't want to pick them up because it's a penny, right? You walk 10 more paces, you look down, there's another penny there. Now, at that point, we don't immediately think that this is an accident that every 10 paces, there's a penny. We think, is somebody doing this on purpose? We walk 10 more paces, there's another penny on the sidewalk exactly 10 steps away from the last penny. Now you're on the fourth one and now your brain is putting together a pattern. Every 10 steps there's a penny on the sidewalk. Test it. Walk five more steps. There's another penny. Or excuse me, 10 steps. Walk 10 more steps. Now you're picking up the sixth penny. 10 more steps. There's another one. 10 more steps. There's another one. And at that point, you start looking around because there are some things that we don't need mathematical proof. There are some things that are just, we understand it. There's an idea that says if you see a turtle sitting on top of a fence post, then you automatically know the turtle did not get there by himself, right? I mean, those are, what do we call that in algebra? An axiom? An axiom is this idea that doesn't need all of these mathematical proofs. They are just accepted as fact. So if a turtle's on a fence post, somebody or something put him there on purpose. If you walk 10 paces and you do this 15 times and every time you do it, there's a penny every 10 steps, then you know that somebody is doing this deliberately because it's not ordinary that you just happen to find a penny every 10 steps you take. That's not, that's out of the ordinary. So you start looking around for, you start looking for a candid camera, right? Or you start looking for somebody who is off in a distance with a handful of pennies smiling at you, right? Because they're, you know, somebody's got to be watching you pick up these pennies. But the idea is that you know for a fact somebody is doing this deliberate. Anytime we see a string of things that we can see clearly are in a pattern, we know that it has to be deliberate. It's like sunrise and sunset. To those of us who believe God, we know that those things just didn't happen by accident. They're done deliberately and they're done with intelligence in mind. So that's the same way I see things in the Bible. When I see words in a list, and I see that list, I get that number, and then I read the context and I see that what's being spoken of has to do with the same thing that that number represents. I know that that's there deliberately. So if I say the number seven is the number for perfection and completion, and I take a number like 490, which is 70 times seven, you've heard that number, right? 70 times seven? If I look in the 490th chapter of the Bible and I see these, these words, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. If I see the number seven in the text and it's talking about the purification of God's word and it's in the 490th chapter of the Bible, I don't automatically conclude that that's an accident. 
I, because of the numerous patterns that I see in this Bible, it leads me to conclude that everything in this Bible is in perfect order, including the very number of books that are in this Bible. And of course, that number is what? 66. We know, starting from Genesis all through Revelation, we don't use the Apocrypha because none of the apostles nor Jesus himself ever one time referred to any of the books of the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha was written between Malachi and Matthew in that 400 year period where God never sent a prophet. He never sent a dreamer of dreams or someone to have visions. God was totally silent during those years. We know that those books that the Catholics add to their Bible should not be in the Word of God. So, here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at this number, 66. And we're going to see then if internally, within the Bible itself, that God has ordained and established that there should be 66 books in our Bible. Instead of the 73 that the Catholic Church adds, or instead of the books of the Bible plus the Book of Mormon, right? We're going to see that how God always designed it. God foreordained that there would be 66 books in the volume of this book that we call the King James Bible. We're going to get it from within the scriptures. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So, what do I believe? I believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. I do not believe the way that this, this verse is corrupted, 2 Timothy 3.16, in some Bibles, I don't, I don't think I've ever checked it in this one. This is one of the first Bibles um, that I got being in the ministry. Uh, where was it? 2 Timothy 3.16. I'm checking the margin notes, okay? In the margin, let's see here if there's a marginal note here. Yeah, there is. This is a Thompson chain reference Bible. Now, I like chain references. I like Bibles where if you read a verse in the margin, there's all these other verses that you can look at that match this verse. I like, to me, that's the way to study the Bible. Let scripture interpret scripture. But some of these marginal notes are absolutely insane. I'm reading the marginal note in my Thompson chain reference Bible pertaining to 2 Timothy 3.16, where it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The marginal note says RV. I don't know if that means recreational vehicle or retired village, retirement village, maybe? No, re revised version. The Westcott and Hort version. Here's what it says. Every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching. That is poison. It's contradictory to what this verse says. This verse says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, meaning everything in this book and every word in this book is the inspired word of God. The other, the revised version, leads you to believe that n not everything in your Bible is inspired, but what is inspired can be profitable for teaching. That's a huge difference. So, if you're going to believe what your Bible says, believe it in the text and not necessarily the margin, okay? So when you have the idea that every word, every verse in this Bible is the inspired word of God, then it will teach you. It will instruct you in righteousness. It will correct you. It will give you doctrine. It'll give you reproof. How do I know what you're saying is true? I can prove it by giving you scripture. So, this number 66. Let's look at John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now I want you to notice the caption that I have above this. Jesus is the Word, 
And the Word is Jesus. Repeat that back to me. Jesus is the Word, and the Word is Jesus. Because that's what that verse is telling you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What most modern Christians, quote unquote, what most people believe is that Jesus, the real actual person of Jesus, is somehow detached from this Bible. That is not true. And how do I know it's not true? Because there is not one verse in the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation that tells me that God's word is something else besides the person of Jesus Christ. So, I believe that Jesus is the Word. And when I say the Word, you notice I'm pointing down to this book. And that the Word is Jesus and they are never to be separated. Now, here's what's interesting, okay? We're going to count the number. We're going to get wisdom and understanding from counting things. If you, if you open your Bible and you look... At John chapter 1, I just quoted for you verses 1 through 5. If you look at verse 6, there's a little, in my Bible, there's a little paragraph marker. And then it starts talking about John. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. So between verses 5 and 6, there's a separation of thought here. So here's what I did. I counted the words, and some of you did this as well and sent it to me. Pastor, I don't know if you know this, but if you count these words, it, let me show it to you, all right? The exact number of words in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and you continue on down through verse 5 where it talks about this Word is the light that shines in darkness, and darkness comprehends it not. No wonder so many people have no understanding of the Bible. It's because they're in darkness, and the God of this world hath blinded them. But what I and others have done is count the number of words in this passage. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, because it represents a complete thought. That number is 66. The number of words in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, where it talks about Jesus being God and God being the Word and the Word being God and the Word is the light that shines to this whole world and the darkness comprehends it not. Exact. So I want you to think about this. A bundle of words that are conveying the thought that your Bible and Jesus are one and the same, those exact number of words, number 66, and there are 66 books in the Bible. Now, you can do this one of two ways. You can go one, two, three, four, five, six. oh, I'd lost count, one, two, three. You can do it that way, or go to purebiblesearch.com, download for Windows, which is what this is, Windows computer, uh, Macintosh or Linux. Some of you are Linux users. I use Linux on some computers that I have. Um, that software will work on all three of those major platforms. Pure, and it's free software, meaning, number one, if you want to download it and copy it and give it out to as many people all over the world as you want, as you can, you're more than welcome to. You don't owe us or anybody else a dime for it. Number two, it's free software in that if you know how to write computer code and you are looking at the code that makes this program and you want to add something to it, you want to take something away from it or whatever, be our guest, okay? Rewrite it however you want to. You may end up messing the whole thing up, but we'll still have the original, all right? And what you can do is highlight those words, look down at the bottom left of your screen, and it'll give you the exact number of words that you highlighted. It's like the easiest way in the world to count things in the Bible. And I just recommend that if you see a thought or a verse that sticks out or God saying something word for word in the Bible, highlight those and count those numbers. You'd be surprised at the things that you would find out. And what, some of the things I'm going to show you either came directly from me studying the word and counting things or other people counting things and sending them to me. And I appreciate that you guys are helping me in ways that you probably will never understand this side of glory. But to me, this is interesting. So now what we have here in this first pattern is we have a penny laying on the ground, all right? 
And you might say, as I did the very first time I saw a pattern in the Bible, I went, maybe that's an accident. And what that was, was I looked at the phrase word of God. And I saw that it was 49 times. That's seven times seven. Perfection times perfection. Think about it. Okay. Uh, and think about the four, and I just mentioned this a while ago, the four primary functions that we do with math. Four. Think of four Gospels. Think of um, uh, New Jerusalem being a city built four square. It represents the spiritual realm. We add, we subtract, or take away. We multiply and we divide. And all four of those concepts are in your Bible. Uh, the concept of dividing, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, multiplying, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Taking away, he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. That's subtraction, adding. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So all four of those things are given to us as complete thoughts in the Bible. They all relate to math. God is a God of numbers. God is a God of precision mathematics. Not some abstract being out there. God is always in order, and that order is so perfect and so divine. So anyway, back to this. We counted the numbers. We find the number 66. We find there are 66 words here, and those 66 words draw our attention to the Bible as a whole. He didn't say in the beginning was the words, plural. He said in the beginning was the word. Now, when we see that, the word of the Lord coming to someone, when we see that in the Bible, we understand that it's more than just one word that's going to be spoken. It's a collective of words that are grouped together that we call the word. So I'm reading scriptures and people are listening to it and in their mind and their hearts, they're saying, surely this is the word of the Lord. And what they mean by that is the collective of those words. So this group of words being referred to as the word and that group of words has 66 words in it exactly, matching the number of books in the whole of the Bible. So what we have is one penny laying on the sidewalk. We bend over, pick it up. Now we have a pocket with one penny in it. Are there more? Of course there are, and that's what we're going to find out. Okay, so let's go to the 66th book of the Bible because this pattern of 66 words <clears throat> spoke of Jesus being the word and giving it to us in 66 words. So let's go to the 66th book of the Bible to see if there is a match between John chapter 1 verses 1 through 5, what it says, and what it says in the 66th book of the Bible. Of course there is. Revelation 19 verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And then it goes on to talk about the oh, uh, verse 15, I like verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now, to me, it's, what's interesting is what is being described here. We have Jesus coming back on a white horse, ten thousands of his saints following with him, all dressed in white, all sitting on horses. I love, I've never ridden a horse. I can't wait. All right? So anyway... Um, and you have here the description of Jesus and a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. What is that? Well, we know from another place and other places in the scriptures that that sword, Paul said in Ephesians 6, the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. So John chapter one, verses one refers to Jesus as the word in the 66th book of the Bible. We have the description of Jesus not only with the sword coming out of his mouth, which is the word of God, but his name is called the word of God. Jesus is the word and the word is Jesus. So we now have our second penny. We have our second pattern and we have a match. This still could be an accident. We don't know yet. Let's keep looking and reading. Let's sort of dissect very quickly the meaning 
of the number six. Now, for a more complete study on this, I've already done this part of the King James Code that deals with the number six. I think it's called Revelation 666, maybe. But anyway, the key, part of the King James Code series where I deal with the meaning of the number six. You go to Genesis chapter six. And what you see in Genesis chapter six is the sons of God mating with the daughters of men. You have opposites, right? Uh, sons of God, daughters of men. You have something from heaven and something from earth joining together. And it's bad. I get it, okay? And it's God forbade it. And God cast those spirits in prison and they're still there. And they're Anyway, but anyway, that's part of the meaning of the number six. Let's take that same idea and let's look at other places and see if we get a double witness of that related to the number six. First Timothy 3.16. I like these 3.16 verses, all right? And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Let's stop right here. God, being a spirit, being manifested in the flesh in the form of Jesus. Jesus, we refer to him as the God-man. He's fully God and fully man. So we have God joining with flesh, God literally being manifested or becoming flesh. In John chapter 1, um, it says, um, yeah, verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So we have, even to this, we have a double witness. The word became flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. To me, I see a connection between that and what the devil and evil spirits are trying to do in Genesis 6. They're trying to join the gods, the spirits, with mortal flesh. And what happened is they created terrorists. They created the giants, mighty men of old, men of renown. All right? So you have a corruption in Genesis 6 of the gods uniting with mankind here. That's the corrupt form of it. The true form of it is God, the Word, became flesh, or God was manifest in the flesh. All right? Um, in, I don't have this in my notes, but I just thought of this. Matthew chapter 1. Here's something I'm going to add to that. Hopefully you're understanding this. Okay, I'm laying the groundwork here. I'm laying the foundation, all right? In Matthew chapter 1, if you look, you have the lineage of Jesus given from Abraham all the way down to Jesus. If you look in verse 17 of Matthew chapter 1, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14, from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14, and from carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So you have 14, 14, 14. Three, three groups, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, because in Christ was the Godhead manifested, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, all manifested in Christ. Even in his birth, you have three groups here, three distinct groups that make up who Jesus is as far as the man side of it. When you add all these together, you end up with 42. 42 is a multiple of seven for God and his perfection, let's say the seven spirits, and the number six for man. Man was created on the sixth day. So even in the number of people in the lineage from Abraham to Jesus that's given to us in Matthew chapter 1, you have that idea of God and man in the same person. Seven times six gives you 42. There's a corruption of that. The beast, who has the number of the beast and the number of a man, think about it, and he continues for how long? 40 and two months, seven times six, okay? So you have God's true form of it, God becoming man or becoming flesh, Satan's corruption of it, Man joining with spiritual beast, okay? The gods, as it were. Does that kind of make sense to you? Anyway, let's get back to 1 Timothy 3.16 because we're going to see the number. We're going to see a pattern. We're going to count it. God was manifest in the flesh. That's number one. Number two, justified in the spirit. Number three, seen of angels. Number four, preached unto the Gentiles. Number five, believed on in the world. And number six, received up into glory. So in this passage... There are six things that characterize or explain to you the mystery of godliness. And the principal idea is that God became flesh. The word 
became flesh and the Word was God, God was manifest in the flesh. All right? Hopefully that kind of gives you an understanding. If we go to Ephesians chapter 6, we find a connection between the number 6 and the Bible. And think about it. Though this book was written by man, the words were not invented by man. Who came up with the words for these men to write? The Holy Ghost. Second Peter chapter 1 says that holy men of God spake as they were moved by who? The Holy Ghost. In this Bible, you have the union of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and man himself in the 66 books of the Bible. So let's go back. Keep that in mind that we're referencing the Bible. And in Ephesians 6, there just happens to be six things that characterize your Bible. Let's look at it. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your, number one, loins girt about with truth. Number two, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Number three, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Number four, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Number five, take the helmet of salvation and look at the number six, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The six, it, there's six things here. And by the way, all six of these are Bible. Your loins girt about with truth. Jesus said, thy word is truth. Breastplate of righteousness. Our righteousness is taught here that uh, the man of God may be instructed in righteousness. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, all right? Uh, but anyway, the shield of faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. All of these are referencing or, or, or can be seen in the word of God. If you need salvation, it's in the word. If you need faith, it's in the word. If you need a sword, it is the word. And the sixth thing mentioned is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So think about it now. This understanding of the number six, that it represents God and man together. So when we count the number of books in our Bible, we have that number multiplied. Not only is it six, but it's 60 and six or three score and six. So you have the number 66 given the meaning of God joining with man in the form of this book. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And that's the meaning of the number six. Pretty cool? So let's set another penny down or let's find another penny on the sidewalk. We've taken now three sets of 10 paces and we found another penny. So we start asking ourselves, is this deliberate? Is this intentional? Was the Bible not only authored by God, but designed by God? I believe it is, okay? So, let's look at the opposite of what I just told you, okay? We have the Word became flesh, um, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We see in the Bible the fusion of God and man together. God was manifest in the flesh, right? So let's go to Daniel chapter 3. Because we have a grouping together of the number 60 and the number 6. It's in a slightly different form, but the numbers are still there. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Stop right here. Sixty and six together in this one image that Nebuchadnezzar erected. All right? Is there a connection between that and the 66th book of the Bible? We're fixing to find another penny, all right? Psalm 115, I want you to think about all of those people who fell. Here we have a picture of the falling away in, in Daniel chapter 3. All those people who fell down and worshiped this image, God describes them in a very interesting manner. In Psalm 115, verse 4, 
Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. Dun, dun, dun. So, you have this image in the plain of Dura. Nebuchadnezzar says, everybody worship this image. So, God's going to curse those who do. The idea behind, they have eyes, see not. They have ears, but they hear not. They have noses, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. They have feet, they can't walk around. The idea behind that is that these idols are stupid. Okay? They're, they have lost their brains. They've lost their minds. They are completely and utterly useless, made to be taken and destroyed. So is everyone that makes them and everyone that worships them. Okay? So now we have, we have the opposite. We have God giving to us the 66 books of the Bible, and he says that this book, his word, is God. All right? Then we have the opposite. We have a man-made idol. Not only are those who make it dumb and ignorant, willfully ignorant, but also those that worship them as well. It could be said that the idol makes the man. Because that's what that Psalm 115 was saying. Those who worship idols end up being just like those idols. Nothing going on up here. The idol makes the man. If we flip that upside down now, the book makes the man. You see what I'm saying? Okay. This book is the book of my life. I don't change this book. This book changes me. This book reproves me. This book corrects me. This book chastises me. This book judges me. All right? So I become more like the image of Christ in this Bible those who worship idols become more like the image that they're worshiping. Nothing. I think the sign language for somebody that's stupid or is this. What it means, here's the frontal lobe. This is where we make our decisions. There's a rock right here. You're a blockhead. Okay? No thoughts. Nothing going on up here. All right? Pretty interesting. Now, let's take that idea them falling before an image, go to the 66th book of the Bible. Revelation 13, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Verse 16, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. Did you count those? Small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. Six things, right? And remember, those that worship this image become like that image. It's the image of a beast and mankind is going to be sent strong delusion. He's going to be sealed. His fate is going to be sealed by way of the mark that everybody's going to take in their right hand or in their forehead. And they are going to become just like that image. Nothing up here. That's why the Bible's counting out for you that there are six groups, and they're all opposites. Small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, all joined together. And even the number, verse 18, here's wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Notice that it's the number of the beast and the number of a man. Same time simultaneously and it's associated with this number six that represents like sons of God daughters of men or God was manifest in the flesh okay I wonder what we find since this number is 603 score and six I wonder what we find in the 666th chapter of the Bible again King James Pure Bible Search software, you can actually hit a button and pull up a little menu and go to the exact number of chapter that you want to. If you want to go to the 537th chapter of the Bible, you click that number and it'll take you right there. It's going to be in Psalms somewhere, I think. 
Okay, but anyway, um, this is how I, now, some of this stuff I did the hard way. Back years ago, before we had this software, I counted out every, I had a little spreadsheet, Excel spread, and I had the number of chapters in every book in the Bible, and I would use that to, to pinpoint an exact chapter number that I wanted, like the 555th chapter of the Bible, Psalm 77, 490th chapter, which would be Psalm 12, right? 70 times 7? Anyway. So let's go to the 666th chapter of the Bible. We made it easy for you to do. And, of course, you could just look on the screen. It's Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Solomon said, I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Whose, whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. Okay, so we have 666 chapter of the Bible telling us that wisdom comes from counting one by one. We have Revelation 13, the number 666, telling us, here's wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number. We now have another penny, 10 steps away from the last penny on the sidewalk, and now we understand that these things, it just doesn't sound right that these things are accidental. And what I like to, when I deal with these numbers or when I deal with number patterns in the King James Bible, I always point out that what I'm showing you are facts. That yes, Ecclesiastes 7 is the 666th chapter of the Bible. Now you might say, well, what about a thousand years ago? We didn't have the chapter. I don't know about a thousand years ago. What I know now is that Ecclesiastes 7 is the 666th chapter of the Bible. Okay? What I know now is, is that in uh, uh, 1 Timothy 316 that there are six things that characterize the mystery of godliness that's what those are the facts what you d choose to do with those facts is your business but i'm going to show you where all the pennies are laying and you're going to see that they're laying exactly 10 steps away from each other and it's consistently done that way again we are taught in our minds, our minds are constantly looking for order, patterns, things that are my father-in-law. Probably got tired of me taking tools out of his shed and not putting them back. So on his pegboard, you may have a grandfather like this. He hung all his tools up and he took a magic marker and outlined every one of them. So if he goes into his shed, it doesn't take him but a second to realize one of his tools are missing. And he knows exactly which one because there's the outline there. And he probably knows who took it. I don't, I don't do that anymore. Okay, but anyway, we recognize order when we see it. We also recognize when something's out of place, right? I'll just tell you that all the things that I'm showing you are from the King James Bible. You're not going to find them in the NIV or New American Standard or English Standard Version or Revised Version. You're not going to find them there. They're not there. They're out of order. They're out of place. Things are missing out of there. As easily as we recognize order, we also recognize things that are not in order. And when I look at these other Bibles, I clearly see it. They're not, they're not in order. All right? So, wisdom and knowledge and understanding come from, they are the seven spirits of God, a part of them, and they come from counting things in the Bible, all right? So now I'm going to show you something. This, this has been on my list for years, okay? Finally get to use it, all right? If I were to say, what's the wisest book of the whole Bible? What would you say? Probably Proverbs, right? Because it's the book of wise sayings. And if you read like Proverbs 1, um, Solomon basically starts out saying, hey, son, get wisdom. Get understanding. It's better than silver and gold. It's better than everything. Uh, the, the second verse of Proverbs says, To know wisdom and instruction, to receive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom. So we have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in the first three verses of the book of Proverbs. And you'll see them all through the book of Proverbs, right? Now, I'm taking all this time to set you up for this because you're going to like this, okay? Let's take the word wise. Just the word wise, W-I-S-E. Wisdom 
comes about from experience and old age and knowing stuff, right? Uh, let me lay the groundwork here. Knowledge builds understanding, and knowledge and understanding give wisdom, right? We refer to old men and old women as being wise. Why? Because they, through 70, 80, 90 years of their life, have collected a lot of facts, and they've put together an understanding of those. Now, some of them are way off, okay? But in many cases, these older folk have wisdom that us younger people, we can't attain to yet because we haven't been through what they've been through yet. But we will. We'll go through all the temptations they go through, okay? So, in order to have wisdom, you must have understanding. In order to have understanding, you must have knowledge. Those three things, to me, are the absolute important things to have when it comes to wanting to know who God is, how he works, and wanting to know what this book is all about. You've got to have knowledge. Knowledge is reading Bible verses and trying to memorize as many as you can. Knowledge of the facts. Understanding is when you start seeing the pieces of the knowledge puzzle put together, and now you have a clear understanding. There may be a situation where you don't understand something. Somebody comes and explains a detail about it that you didn't have, and all of a sudden you go, okay, I get it. I understand now. Thank you for telling me. I now understand why this person did this. It's because you received more knowledge, all right? And you put the facts together, you got understanding. Wisdom is the part that directs how we react to those things in life around us. Foolishness is, we've been told a thousand times, and we've seen it over and over, that if we do certain things in life, it's going to hurt us and probably try to kill us, and it's going to cause us a lot of trouble, like taking drugs, right? After you take drugs for about a year, you now have or should have the wisdom that drugs makes you do bad things that's cost you everything in the world and it's going to kill you. Some people just would rather be in foolishness, I guess. Because some people look at it and say, you know what, I'm not even, I'm not even going to get started. I, I've never taken meth in my life, ever. Never smoked crack, never snorted cocaine, never smoked marijuana, nothing like that. You know why? Because all I did was look at the lives of the people who are doing it and I said, you know, I don't want any part of that. I don't care how good it makes you feel, I want no part of that. Because wisdom tells me that if I start in down that road, I'm going to end up just like those people, probably dead. All right, anyway, let me get to the scriptures. Okay? I'm preaching is what I'm doing. Let me show you what's in, let me show you the neat stuff that's in the Bible. The word wise. In the book of Proverbs, the word wise, 66 times exactly the word wise. Look at it, Proverbs 1, 6. To understand a proverb and the inter interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark saying. Stop right here. Here are the words of the wise in the 66 books of the Bible, and you just happen to have the word wise, and the words of the wise mentioned in Proverbs, and the word wise is listed in the book of Proverbs exactly 66 times. Is that, is that an accident? It's a fact. Is what it is, okay? Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Proverbs 13.14, the law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Proverbs 15.24, the way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. Wisdom is what's keeping you out of hell, right? Because if you didn't have biblical wisdom, you would, be, you would go around singing, Highway to hell, bah, bah, and air jamming, right? No drums. Anyway, that's what you would be doing. If you didn't have the wisdom from this book, you'd be on your way to hell right now. But it's the wisdom from above that keeps your soul from going to hell. Amen? The word wise, 66 times in the book of Proverbs, King James Version. That is a fact. What about the word knowledge? The word knowledge comes in various forms in the book of Proverbs, like know, knoweth, knowing maybe, and knowledge. So, you know how you search for this? You isolate the book of Proverbs in your search bar, 
and type in the letters K-N-O-W and then hit an asterisk, all right? And then hit enter. And what it's gonna do, it's gonna find every form of the word know, like know, knowledge, knowing, knoweth. Every form of the word know is gonna appear in your search window and all forms of the word no in the book of Proverbs 66 times exactly. Proverbs 1, 2, to know wisdom and instruction. Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 1, 23, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you and I will make known my words unto you. See how it's connected? The Bible is telling you, I will make known my words unto you. I'll pour my spirit out to you and I will make known my words unto you. Okay? So the form of the word know, 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 knowledge, uh, knoweth. All forms of that word 66 times in the book of Proverbs. And they point you to knowing the words. All right? Knowing the words. So we have... The word wise, 66 times in the book of Proverbs. We have all forms of the word know, 66 times in the book of Proverbs. What about understanding? Of course. All forms of the word understand, such as understandeth, understanding, can be found exactly 66 times in the book of Proverbs. Again, Proverbs 1, 2, to know wisdom and instruction, to receive the words of understanding. To understand a proverb in the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Proverbs 2, 6, for the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and what? Understanding. And it, it doesn't matter which word you pick, whether it's wise or know or knowledge or, or understanding or understand or whatever. It doesn't matter what word you pick. All of them, 66 times in the same book of the Bible, King James Version Bible, 66 times in the book of Proverbs, and there are 66 books in the book of life that the Holy Spirit wants to make known these words unto you. Oh, look, there's another penny. Ten more steps. Oh, look, there's another penny. Ten more steps. Oh, look, there's another penny. So we've laid down enough pennies already to where you should understand that this book is in order and that God selected each and every word to be in this book and you say well, I don't know if I believe I don't, I don't believe any translation can be inspired really what verse is that what verse actually I need two or three I'll take one what verse in the Bible tells you that no translation that God cannot translate or God does not translate words into another language what verse tells you that what verse in the bible tells you that you can look for mistakes in the bible what verse of the bible tells you that there are mistakes in the bible you see god be true every man a liar right if god says that every word is pure if god says that his word is totally incorruptible if God says that the test of a prophet is that he can only be wrong one time and then he's not God's prophet, and yet you think there's something wrong in your Bible, what does that tell you? If God's word tells you that it's perfect and man says it's not, who do you believe? I choose to believe what this book says over and above what anybody in this world says, including me and my own wife. Let God be true and every man a liar. So we have recognizable patterns already related to the number 66, tucked away very neatly, appropriately, in your King James Bible. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter six, okay? Matthew chapter six. Matthew five and six are referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. Why do we call it that? Because in Matthew five, verse one, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was said, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, and you have these red letters in, in Matthew chapter five, all the way down in Matthew chapter six, Matthew chapter seven. I mean, you think I preach long? That's a long sermon, all right? So in Matthew chapter six, we have, embedded into the Sermon on the Mount what we call the model prayer or some call it the Lord's Prayer. 
It is the basis of how you and I are to frame our prayers you know, with God. Now, I'm not one of these guys that says, now, if you don't say all the words right, God's not going to do anything for you. I don't believe that. I don't, the Bible doesn't teach that. Okay? The Bible teaches us to cry out like little children unto God. God will hear us. God knows how to fix our problems. We don't have to tell him how. Okay? But anyway, we have the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, part of the Sermon on the Mount. Let's look at it. By the way, I'll just tell you, there are 66 words exactly in this prayer. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All those words, starting with our Father, ending with amen. 66 words exactly. Now you say, now okay, pastor, but you know, what does that mean? Does that mean that we should pray Bible verses? No. I'll tell you one thing that I know is that if we will pray in accordance with what we know is in God's word, God will bless it. But let's say, and I knew a guy, I knew a guy. This guy was asking me whether he could do it, and I'm reasonably sure that he was asking God the same thing because he was having an affair with a woman in his church. And this guy had a wife and kids. They were all going to the same church, and he was having an affair with the piano player. And he kept coming to me wanting to know if it was okay to leave his wife and join with his... He said, because I really feel like I was meant to be with her. So that tells me that at some point he's asking God if God will let him divorce his wife and go run off with this other woman. God's not in that nonsense. That is not in accordance with God's word. But if you pray in accordance with what you know God said, you can't pray, God, let me go out and commit adultery. Can I do that? You can't pray that. God won't bless that. You might get away with it. God's not going to bless it. You're in bad trouble, okay? But if you pray in accordance, like Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And that's what the, the prayer says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 66 words that will teach you to pray after the manner of the kingdom of God and his will as given to us in the 66 books of the Bible. So, I, I did this yesterday. I asked the Lord, Lord, I wonder what's in the 660th chapter of the Bible. 600, we know what's in 666, Ecclesiastes 7. What's the 660th chapter? Would that be 66 times 10? It's Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The very first verse, look at it. The words of the preacher. Remember here? Remember who the preacher is? It's Jesus. And this is his Sermon on the Mount. 66 words in that prayer. 660th chapter. It's telling you that this is the words of the preacher. I remember reading this years. I was out on a deer stand hunting deer. Reading my Bible. And I was just saying, God, show me something. God, I feel empty. I need you. I need you to talk to me through your word. And I opened up to Psalm or to Ecclesiastes 1, and it said the words of the preacher. And I, and I went, doodads just came on me. And I started crying. I'm going, this book, this whole book is the words of the preacher, the preacher, Jesus Christ. And that's in the 660th chapter of your Bible. We laid another penny down. We found another penny, didn't we? Okay. So then I thought of, we have the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. There's also what I call the Sermon in the Valley. Preaching that was done in the valley of dry bones. Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and, and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. 
Again, he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter in you, and ye shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. Behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come up from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came in, uh, into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Amen. It's, see, we know who this army is. We know that this is the tribes of Israel in the last days. And their bones are scattered. They're all over the place. And what God, we know for a fact, we know from Bible what God's going to do. God's going to gather them back together as one body, one group. And he's going to reunite them. And he's going to prophesy to them. And the, how many wins? Four. Think Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's where Christ is. That's where he died, rose again. That's where he provided the atonement. That was, that's where the lamb was slain. Amen. And Ezekiel's going to prophesy to the wind, and the wind is going to blow. It's going to fill their nostrils, and they're going to be alive. And they're going to stand on their feet in an exceeding great army. God's going to make an army out of people that people gave up on a long time ago because they're dead, their bones are scattered, they're very dry. Not only are they dead, they're very dead and have been that way for a long time. And yet nothing is too hard with God and God's going to bring them back together. And I just felt a nudge one day by the Holy Ghost. Might count the words that God himself speaks to those bones. So I put them together for you. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live and I will send you upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. You shall know that I am the Lord. That's 50 words. And then come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. That's 16 words. The total is 66. And again, you think about what it means. Whenever prophesying is done, we are to prophesy of the word of God alone. Okay, the Bible says preach the word, meaning the collective of what's in this book. All 66 books. Okay. And think about it. We know that the Old Testament was written to Israel, right? But we also know, like James. James wrote to the 12 tribes, right? The book of Hebrews was written to who? Hebrews, right? We have the book of First and Second Peter. We know that Peter was dispatched to, be, uh, to preach the gospel to the Jews, right? So is the New Testament for Israel as well? Absolutely. Jeremiah 31, 31, God says, I'm going to give you a new covenant. It's not going to be like the Mount Sinai covenant. It's going to be something your fathers never even thought of. I'm going to, in this covenant, this is the covenant where I forgive all your sins. The first covenant is where I name all your sins. The second covenant is where I forgive all of your sins. So what's going to happen to Israel? They're going to be prophesied to. And the four winds, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are going to blow into their nostrils. They're going to be saved just like you and I were saved by the blood atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen? And they're going to rise and live. And in this King James Bible, the number of words that are spoken by God to these bones, 66 exactly. And that matches the 60. In fact, if we go to the 66th book of the Bible, which is Revelation, right? It's always a connection with Revelation. Always is. In Revelation 7, verse 1, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. Well, that's what Ezekiel was told to prophesy to, the four winds. You have angels holding them back. They're holding them back for a reason. What's the reason? Um, 
that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel sending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Then it gives you, it lists each tribe, and tells you twelve thousand from each tribe. Twelve thousand times twelve is one hundred forty-four thousand. So here, Ezekiel 37, 66 words are prophesied to the bones, and in the 66th book of the Bible, you see these bones resurrected, given life, and sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Is that an accident? I don't think so. We've already laid down enough pennies for you so that you could plainly see that there is an order to this Bible Related to the number 66, the exact number of books in the King James Bible. And I'm not even gotten started yet. I mean, I've been setting the foundation for you. Now, next week, we're going to move. We're going to go fast. I'm going to show you these wonderful patterns. Maybe even some, will some new things will come to me between now and then. I'll just get excited and add it to it. But I hope already you've seen that there should be 66 books in the Bible, right? The Pope didn't declare that. They didn't give us the Bible. The Holy Ghost did through the, through the early church men, the early church fathers collecting these books together and they all agreed this is the Word of God. And it turned out to be 66 books exactly. And that matches very profound patterns that are in this Bible. And we'll see the rest of those next week, all right? Hope you can't wait because I can't wait to tell them to you, all right? I love doing stuff like this because it's light and it's easy and it's uplifting and it's meant to show us that everything God does is in perfect order, all right? Hey, I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.